Okay, uh, thank you very much, MC. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, very uh, good afternoon. So, insyaAllah, I'm given uh, about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So, I'll, I'll do my very best to make it very uh, brief and concise. So, uh, I'm Ismi Arif Ismail, the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic and International, University Putra Malaysia. Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm going to share just uh, a quick reminder to myself and to everyone with regards to how uh, we can use some of these points to, uh, you know, uh, revisit and assess uh, to what extent, you know, we are ready, um, you know, in terms of as uh, higher learning institutions uh, to respond to the, to the new trends and to the, the new challenges ahead. So under the title of New Trends in Higher Education, where are we now? So, of course, you know, uh, VUCA is, is, is a common word now. Uh, higher education ecosystem in the new era will be more agile, fluid and flexible to suit with the rapid changes surrounding it. And the new trends will bring a number of significant changes to the higher education landscape. So these are some of the points that myself and my team members at the university always use, you know, to, to sort of like uh, take stock and, uh, you know, reassess, you know, how far you know, we have fulfilled and what are the gaps that we need to ensure that we can fill in, okay? So, of course, uh, forward thinking higher education leaders and professionals can capitalize on these trends to enhance their practices in leadership government and governance curriculum and instruction, research and innovation, industry and community relation, as well as student development. So basically, this is the core business that we have to address, you know, in terms of how we want to bring our institution to the next level. To some who are experts and experienced, I can see your faces, treat this as a revision, okay? I can see you are smiling, okay? Thank you very much. So the first one, of course, when we talk about leadership and governance, um, you know, we have been uh, you know, bombarded with all these uh, challenges. You have to make sure that you are future-proof. So higher education leaders should be agile and ready to adjust their styles of leading and managing the organizations to suit the situations and the stakeholders that they are dealing with. Of course, in public universities now, we are so used to the, to the traditional structure of having you know, vice-chancellor, deputy vice-chancellors. And of course, now some universities have embarked into having pro vice chancellors or assistant uh, vice chancellors. So these are some of the strategies that I think uh, we have to, you know, to relook because uh, this is a, a debate that we are very much in, you know, uh, these this few weeks, you know, about having an institutional leaders between having a, a so-called scholar and having a, a, a more entrepreneurial university leaders, you know, how, how do you balance this? Because of course, to appoint a, you know, a top-notch research professor will be a feather on the cap of an institution. But how confident you are in terms of having this top research professor, the ability to lead, to mobilize people, because you know, if you, we go back to the to, to the bottom line of leadership. It's, it's just always about concern for productivity and concern for people. So this is the questions that we at the university, and I think at the university, we have our National Higher Education Leadership Academy, ACAP, the search committee, you know, still debating on what kind of individuals we need, you know, to lead a university to make sure that the university will not just be you know, the, the, the institutions of uh, learning, but at the same time, an organization that can always be mobilized to be more productive, not just, uh, you know, an institution that focus only on uh, quote unquote, teaching and learning and research and innovation. The second one is about how far, you know, in terms of our ability to collaborate with multiple stakeholders, you know, namely the government, the industries, alumni and donors, 
both locally and globally in the day-to-day -day operation of the institution. I think just now the discussion was very interesting, talking about the collaboration in terms of research, the collaboration in terms of technology, the, 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 the collaboration in terms of uh, sharing of data, but how far can you do that? How much should you protect and how much should you share? You know, in terms of data, technology, as well as your research and innovation, intellectual properties, and one more. And then, of course, data analytics for decision and action will be the new trend of higher education leaders to ensure efficiency and effectiveness of the institutional delivery system. You cannot do away with the two. You cannot just be satisfied with efficiency without effectiveness or effectiveness without efficiency. So this is another challenge that we have to you know, uh, ponder and uh, relook how far we deal this. Of course, most universities now we have our CIO, but who are our chief information officer? What are their real roles and functions? How do they work with our uh, chief technology officer, uh, our CDO, and so on and so forth? Now we have so many COO, COO. Okay, all right. The fourth would be in terms of funding. We foresee that funding will always be a challenge. And how do we convert this into something that will be our day-to-day -day discussion at the universities or the higher learning institutions? So we see funding and student enrollment will be the critical factors for institutional survival. Without students, you know, uh, I mean, we cannot go far. Of course, at the universities now, we work not just through the conventional, but also into all this ODL, offshore, and executive education to ensure that the way we deliver is more diverse. How far have we opted for this new way of providing our programs, not just locally, but also across the globe? So establishing high quality faculties or schools and research institutes will attract funding and high quality prospective students. And this will strengthen the ecosystem. So of course, it's not just about the institutions. It is also about the people in the institutions. And we see a very fluid mobility across institutions. Another strategy would be to have double or triple appointment of faculty members, of researchers, to make sure that we can always collaborate inter-institutions and making sure that we are in the blue ocean or the healthy competition, rather the unhealthy competition. Number five, of course, curriculum. The new trend also envisions more fluid and flexible competency-based curriculum as the framework that facilitates more customized and technology-integrated teaching learning activities, optimizing augmented virtual and mixed realities to complement the face-to-face -face interaction where students can learn from anywhere and at any time. Of course, at the ministry and the university, inshallah, next week, we are starting with the new uh, program where students spend two years at the universities and two years hybrid with the intention that we can provide more experiential learning across academia, industry and community. So, inshallah, wish all the best to everyone. Okay, starting next week, uh, we hope to see a brighter future in the new arrangement. And on top of that fluid and flexible curriculum, we talk about micro competency based open and distance learning, as well as the face to face experiential learning opportunities, which will enable students to learn at their own pace in meeting their unique and personalized needs. How far have we provided this to our students at our respective institutions? So student mobility will be more in virtual form rather than the conventionally physical movement across the globe. 
So that is another new way of looking at how we address student mobility. And with regards to research and innovation, a more translational and demand-driven research and innovation ecosystem, we talk about translational research, which intensively rely on strong university-industry-community relation, will ensure that both fundamental and applied research efforts will directly impact on the targeted beneficiaries. Of course, now we have, you know, when we talk about uh, translational research, people talk about applied, demand-driven, but how do we make sure that this can always coexist with the fundamental research so that then you have the best of both worlds? This also deserves our prime attention. And with regards to student development, the new trend in student development will see a more holistic approach that emphasizes on experiential learning. That's why we, uh, in the ministry we opt for, you know, together with the university, we opt for the TU2H, mentoring and coaching activities that will help to unleash their potentials and nurture the students to grow as brave, bold, humble, and wise individuals. Interesting, this now Gupadip mentioned about, you know, you, you have students, you know, training, uh, train them to become cyber security experts. And of course, uh, another way of looking is trying to nurture them to be great hackers, but maybe angel hackers rather than devil hackers, eh? inshallah. Okay. Rather than breach the data, respect the data, inshallah. Okay. All right, and then of course, number nine, on top of all this, with all these initiatives, we have to go back to what kind of leaders do we have at our institutions. So we profoundly need higher education leaders with an entrepreneurial mindset to lead our institutions and the citizens to thrive through these new trends and the challenging years ahead. So this is the debate that I mentioned to you just now. We have two schools of thoughts. One is to look at leaders who, of course, everyone should be scholars. But the thing that differentiates between a university leaders is the entrepreneurial mindset. No point of having a top research professors who are not entrepreneurial, who cannot really mobilize resources, so on and so forth. But another one, another school of thought, talk about if you just have somebody, uh, you know, uh, quote unquote, not so, you know, uh, uh, top researcher, for example, how can he or she command the professors or the researchers in the institutions? So these are the, 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 the things that we need to balance up. Of course, the ideal would be to have somebody who is not only a scholar, a top scholar, but can also mobilize people or mobilize resources in the universities or higher learning institutions. But that is a very rare species. So we have to really do our very best to find this rare species where you have the best of both worlds, a scholar and a true leader. And of course, finally, besides being entrepreneurial, you know, talking about, uh, you know, resilient, a uh, 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 risk taker, we also need a higher education leaders with futuristic mindset who can really think, uh, you know, 20 years, 30 years from now, to lead our institutions and the citizens to be future ready and thrive through these new trends and the challenging years ahead. Out of these 10, look back at your institutions. I also have to look at UPM, how far we, you know, we fulfill these 10 requirements of making sure that we can really face and address the new trends and challenges in higher education in the future. So with that, I thank you very much to everyone. I hope you have benefited from my short sharing. Thank you. Assalamualaikum.